Uh, it's it's, it's five yeah. ten, so I, let's I start, guess let's just, just get going. Start. Yeah. So this is a Ask the Expert s session. So hopefully you guys are yeah. uh, bringing your questions because um, this is yeah. your time to ask them. Uh, to introduce myself first, uh, I'm your moderator. I'm Kurt Stam. I have been with Red Hat since 2006. I mostly work on integration projects. Uh, and I started with JBoss ESB, and currently I work on synth Synthesis, which is a low coding uh, plat platform to do integrations based on Camel. So um, the panel uh, to the Daniels to make it easy. Uh, Danny, Daniel Walsh, do you want to introduce yourself, say a little bit about what yeah, you're so, doing? And... Yeah, go ahead uh, first. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, so I'm Dan Walsh. I'm, uh, my title at Red Hat's uh, Senior Distinguished Engineer, which I always tell people means I'm an old engineer. And um, uh, basically, I run the container engine team, chief architect of, of all things containers at the operating system level. So everything that's underneath the OpenShift and Kubernetes. And uh, I, you know, I, and, and my main task is to make Diane Mueller happy. So when she yells at me, I have to do stuff. So. Cool. Very good. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So my name is Daniel O and then another Daniel and yeah so I'm I'm also working for Red Hat as a technical marketing major and the specifically application runtime and the cloud native runtime such as Spring Boot, Quarkus and Node.js and BirdX and there's some data grid and it, of course JVC EAP our domain cashier uh, flow and yeah so I'm trying to uh, give some inspiration how to build cloud every application and how to consider to new cloud neighbor architecture and the reference architecture is based on of course red hat technology but also uh open source technology such as the cncf stuff so i am also responsible for cncf ambassador so yeah feel free to ask any around that topic yeah we are ready to answer that so i have a question because daniel you just said a whole bunch of terms that i know very little about i used to tell people that i do i've done java for 20 years and it's been one day per year for 20 years um but the uh, I, i've heard about this new java engine for uh containers and uh i guess a lot of the development happened at red hat and it's supposed to be really really cool so why don't you tell us about that yeah absolutely that is a really good question yeah so you know, so first of all, the, there are a lot of the Java stack uh, many, many years ago. So actually Java was born uh, 25 years ago. So this, is the, this year actually 25 years in anniversary of the Java, app, Java framework. And then the most Java stack was born for, for container technology, like a, yeah, the OCI, uh, I'm not saying the, the D some stuff. <laughs> and mm -hmm. yeah, and then the Kubernetes technology. So just a couple of years ago, maybe three and five years ago, the, Linux container technology and Kubernetes uh, were born. And after that, there are big challenges for Java stack, how to optimize the Java application learning on top of that, rather than just a single VM or a bare metal. So in order to catch up the new that kind of technology, so new Java stack are a little bit more focused on uh, the way how to increase the development of productivity and also how to enable Java developer to develop reactive application as well as the traditional imperative application. Also, anytime a new developer uh, just can evolve existing Microsoft application to serverless or eventually even the application and running on top of the Kubernetes with the containerization. So this is all bunch of the new characteristic and features and this is a mandatory uh, requirement uh, to uh, I mean, for new cloud native Java stack. And the Quarkus is invented by Red Hat, and a lot of uh, contributor and committer already participated in new Quarkus project. It's a uh, Quarkus new open source project, uh, really focused on Kubernetes native, which means uh, we can provide uh, some new feature of Java to develop 
more uh, optimized uh, Java application running on top of Kubernetes. For example, uh, maybe uh, you can run Java application with the same or even uh, faster than any other Java stuff, like a millisecond start of time and a small memory footprint, like a, uh, maybe just five megabyte to edge memory footprint and running on top of the uh, Kubernetes with the containerization. So this is all new stuff based on Kubernetes and Linux container technology. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, so uh, so Dan, you you're jumping the the the, the gun here because I think you're avoiding uh, me asking the question how to manage security right among multiple external parties. So so let's say I have you know three or four different external parties that I want to interface with with my containers. How would I go about that? <laughs> Do you have patterns that you usually follow uh... or? products that you usually use. So you want or... you want three different entities to all be able to communicate. Uh, um, yeah. Actually that's that's somewhat above my uh, my level. So uh, I might I might have to throw that back to Daniel. But I, I mean my usual answer to a question like that would be, you know, that's something to be done at the Kubernetes level. So it's um, you're you you're basically wiring together um, different workloads and different container entities. Um, and uh, so you really want something like Kubernetes where you can basically put a, a statement forward that these three entities can communicate and then allow the Kubernetes engines and the whole software suite or the whole OpenShift software suite to actually do all the wiring and hook those up together. Uh, because uh, as, as you sort of showed there is doing that by hand or humans getting involved in that, humans make lots and lots of mistakes. So using something like Kubernetes to you know, basically orchestrate and wire together um, your communications paths is, is what I would recommend um, uh, for that type of thing. Yeah. But would you would you like use some kind of authentication well, framework like that does a lot? Yeah, I mean the other or... <laughs> uh, the basically, yeah, I mean, again, I, I I know all the low level stuff, so I wouldn't. Uh, Daniel, bail me out here. Do you have? Uh, uh, yeah, what are the authentication <laughs> stacks that OpenShift currently supports? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, yeah. Actually, I'm not a, the OpenShift expert, <laughs> not a lot, but yeah. So yeah, there are some yeah OpenShift authentication based on uh yeah you can use the actually uh maybe some uh what is that uh the based on key clock I mean the single right. sign on and also you can integrate the external uh, authentication like a, a uh, GitHub or some any uh, LDAP server or something like that to authenticate your uh, group and user uh, some permission and some kind of authority. And also, uh, there are things a, a lot of way to integrate the security uh, capability with the OpenShift container platform. And speaking of security stuff, and actually, I got a bunch of the question from developer because the Kubernetes and OpenShift is a like a big giant toy for developer, which means another big challenge to learn a lot of stuff. Okay, so I just need to deploy my application into Kubernetes. But before that, I needed to containerize that application. So there are some base image or some middle layer, some container image, a lot of layers. And then one of the uh, most interesting part for developer so what kind of tool I needed to use on my local machine? And then sometimes I need to install some container engine or container CLI. And sometimes I need to the root privilege to run it on my local machine, maybe as part of the CI CD pipeline. But you know what? A lot of enterprise developers uh, just use the company uh, laptop, which means that there are so many some constraints to use root privilege. Uh, but Previously, uh, the developer doesn't need to uh, use, uh, I mean, container technology or Kubernetes to develop their application, but now things change. So how to manage that, some uh, avoid some root privilege or some admin uh, permission uh, to containerize the application or build, et cetera, maybe as a part of build uh, CI CD pipeline. I think it's right. then give some good inspiration to that. Yeah, I mean, it, 
it, it's a difficult problem because there is so varied, you know, environments where, um, you know, the world I live in, where I'm sitting on a Linux desktop, you know, it's, it's pretty easy for me. Yeah. But uh, you know, when you get to you know sitting on a Mac box or a Windows box, and how do you how now you know, you're telling this person he has to develop you know uh, containerized technology? So in in my world, I would tell them you know to you know get some like Podman running on top of the Mac and the Windows box, have it you know an SSH connection to a a VM or a, a, a cloud instance uh, running, you know, basically Podman in the cloud, and then uh, you know hook those up, and you could you know, start out by developing simple containers. So, so um, I, I think taking a say a, a, an application that's sitting in a you know running on bare metal or you know as a regular inside of a VM and moving it to a container um is one step and that step doesn't necessarily have to be right into kubernetes right so it's it's, it's sometimes we take this big leap say okay I, I gotta take you know i have this simple application that runs on top of a web server now i have to get you know the first step is to get containerized and then the next step is to get you know in into kubernetes so what we're trying to do with the our container engines effort in podman is to allow them to sort of play with the container just using you know, similar to what, you know, the Docker command line, the Podman command line. And then we have Podman generate kube, which will take, you know, your environment once you get it up and running and actually generate the Kubernetes YAML. So there's, it's fairly complex um, YAML definitions for what, you know, running a, a, a container inside of um, Kubernetes. Um, and for me, anyways, the way I program is all cutting and pasting, right? I need to have something you know, three quarters filled out so I can go in and, and muck it around as opposed to, you know, writing the entire thing from scratch, especially something as, as complicated as a YAML file. Um, so that's that's sort of the way we go. Now, OpenShift itself has all these really cool features that allow you, you know, allow developers to, you know, to build images and to build pipelines where they can just do a Git check-in to a, a service and they can have actions off of the Git check-in to have it automatically file out to a build, you know, into a, a builder and have, you know, that whole process going. And OpenShift has capabilities to actually do developing um, in basically in your web browser. So you can actually go into a web browser and do it. And, th and that's really critical for a certain, uh, certain people I talk to in the deep dark government who basically never want a piece of software to ever exist on your laptop, right? So the mere fact that the software would be on your laptop is, is you know, a national security thing, risk. And so what they want people to do is to basically use, you know, remote access to uh, where the software software exists and, and be able to do a development there. So there is lots and lots of different models and, and uh, you know, depending on your level, you know, if you have, if you're like me and you've been working in Linux for the last, you know, or Unix for the last, you know, 40 years, it's, you know, yeah. I have to, have, I have to have, you know, Emacs and a, a little box. Yeah. So as opposed to someone on a Mac and might have, you know, fancy IDEs and how do we plug those into the entire suite and, um, and then the other people who have to deal in, in web browsers and stuff. So, yeah. So, so, so Daniel, oh, re related to that, how do you develop? Because I, I like having all the code on my machine, right? I like having the whole cloud stack on my machine. So I know nobody else can mess with me, right? Nobody else can change anything but me. And therefore, I, I can de debug the whole stack. I can have four or five containers running and, and debug it that way. But it seems harder and harder to maintain that. I mean, it seems like... My machine is getting hotter and hotter yeah. by the by the day, and it's going to. You just need more. You need more memory. Thirty thirty two gig memories. Yeah. 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 yeah you gotta you gotta grab some more of the uh, good laptops. Okay. So yeah, actually that happened to everybody. So my case a little bit something different because I have a multiple environment in my local machine in a public cloud, even private cloud, and even multi cloud. Depends on the what kind of demo I want to showcase for conference or customer, etc. But just go back to the, your question for just normal developer, that they just want to try to develop all stuff in their local machine, just sometimes to uh, link to the Git repository, just push the source code, but that's all. So, but 
in order to test or to run your application on Kubernetes cluster, but you don't want to uh, have you don't want to use the remote cluster like a Kubernetes or Open Container Platform. I think there are two pretty good options for them. First of all, uh, Minikube is just the Orinon package. The Kubernetes cluster is a small one, so you just run just maybe maybe a six gig or even eight gig. Uh, you know, memory preferring to run up and you can deploy that application and you can have also cross admin uh, permission to manage your own cluster and also uh, the OpenShift also provide the container ready, uh, a code ready container, a CIC, code ready containers. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is a small version of a mini cube and but it also allows developer to have uh, some nice feature like a OpenShift feature like a uh, deployment config or dev console or operator things so really easy yeah. so for example i want to uh make sure my application uh is connect to a database but not uh in memory database like h2 but but also maybe i need to uh, make sure communication with the postgresql or mongodb or something else maybe data grid but in order to uh, test, you don't need to install every single software on your local machine. Just check, just uh, access your uh, small piece of open container platform like a CRC, and then just deploy that uh, software uh, using operator. You, it will be deployed in a just a couple of seconds, and uh, you know, another part like a MongoDB or a Postgres will be spinner in just five seconds or ten seconds. But still, it's all your local machine. Yeah, yeah, but still, maybe you need to make 12 gig or 16 gig laptop. So actually, I'm using the MacBook 12 gig. So sometimes when I run CIC or Minikube and I'm running on VS Code, sometimes my computer is just that. <laughs> but just to make sure how many memory you are consuming uh, during the development, but still a good option for developer 100% free. Yeah, also maybe like a Dan, maybe high spec a laptop like a Linux operating system, maybe you can install OKD, like a, the community yeah. version of the container platform, you can install that on your local machine. It's a pretty easy, yeah, maybe just right. 30 right. minutes to finish the installation. Also, you can have the Podman builder to containerize your application build. Yeah, yeah. speaking of builder and Podman, there's some people still confused uh, about the between uh, Podman builder, I mean the use cases or right. who needed to use builder rather than Podman. Maybe yeah, so, then give some inspiration to that. Yeah, sure. I mean, basically, you know, Podman is Podman build is is builder. So if you're using a, you know, if you're building a container image with the container tools, or if you're using OpenShift builder, that's also builder. So uh, builder is, you know, builder is sort of a fairly low level tool um, that uh, you know supports fully supports docker file and and it supports this thing called container file that looks a very much like docker file but doesn't have to you know always say a company name in the uh, in the context but um, <laughs> so uh, builder is again it's a, it's a low level tool it's but in some ways it's sort of you know comparing uh, you know Emacs to set ed or something, you know, it's like a, 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 or a, a you know, a Visual Studio to VI, right? Yeah. It's it's just it's just a two different levels of, of the uh, stack. Uh, most people that are using Builder right now are are really using it for tightly controlled builds inside of containers. So uh, you know, we're we, we're spending a lot of time working with people, helping them get. Um, they want to take their builds and put them into a CI CD system to put them into Kubernetes and, and just have thousands of builds going on simultaneously, you know, sort of like OpenShift um, is doing. And I, I believe that's the, the most secure way to build your containers is, you know, build your containers inside of a container, right? Lock, wrap down that because um, inside of that container, you need to have, uh, let's just call it multiple UIDs. A lot of times we say you need to have root, but what you, what you really need when you're building a container image is you need to have more than one UID, right? Nobody, very few people build an image that only supports one UID. So in order to build the image, you need multiple UIDs. And uh, usually you need one of them that identifies as root. 
um, to, to be able to do this. So when we look at building inside of something like OpenShift, you end up with, you know, uh, requiring that users basically be able to launch something that has, say, 65,000 UIDs while it's doing the build because it's going to, you know, create, you, uh, you know, root own files, say Apache own files and, you know, user own files, whatever on, on the operating system. Um, so what we've been working a lot is to get user namespaces plugged into to, uh, uh, OpenShift. And, and this has been a long slog. I've been talking about open, I've been talking about using namespace all the way back to 2013. And, and yet, you know, I guess Podman is probably the main user of user namespaces at this point. Um, but we, we're really just about to get functionality into uh, Cryo, which is a container engine that OpenShift and Kubernetes use now. So that you can go out to Cryo and say, okay, I need, you know, 10,000 UIDs for, to build a container and it will hand you a user namespace for random 10,000 UIDs and they'll control those 10,000 UIDs. So if it hands out 10 of those, they'll be all unique groups of 10,000 UIDs. And then you can do your builds inside of these environments. And, and as far as security now, you're really good because you know, you're running UID, you know, 100,000 through 110,000. The next guy's running, you know, 200,000 to 210,000. If you escape from the container, onto the host, you know, you would be treated just like UID 100,000, UID 200,000. But inside of your container, you have root, you know, you basically are root. So you can do things like change UIDs. And that, the, the funny thing is an OpenShift, you know, OpenShift is really great about forcing people to, you know, by default run their containers as non-root, which is, I, I think, almost every container in the world you know, unless you're managing the, the operating system, unless you're modifying the kernel or modifying the operating system, you don't need to run as root in these environments. Um, but there are certain use cases. We have a, we have a, a large customer who uh, has a database product, and I won't name them, but that probably drops it down to about three customers in the world that do databases, but uh, three companies in the world that do databases. And, and what they, they actually have, uh, you know, they're trying to run inside of OpenShift, and when they run the database, um, what they do is they get their SQL queries coming into the database and they have the database running as a single UID. And so the data or the database is owned by that. But when a, a SQL query comes in, they want to run that SQL query in a different UID than the UID that the database is running. So what they do is they have their, their database comes in, so a connection comes in and, and what they want to do is just chone and fork off a process as a different UID and then allow you know that SQL query to be executed under that UID, so that if there's some <laughs> SQL attack, they'll be running as a different UID and not able to directly access the database. And getting things like that to work in Kubernetes without turning off all the security is like jumping through hoops. And so that's sort of a use case where you, know, you don't need a huge amount of UIDs, but you need you know more than one. Um, uh, and, and, you know, so that's this type of stuff that we're actually, you know, at the high level of open shift we're working at. Um, cool. So. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's still not anybody who has the question into the chat. So I'm a little disappointed. Uh, yeah. yeah. Friday. Yeah. We're, we're very, we're very intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I can bring on some one, uh, topic if I may. So. Agile, Agile track name is uh, serverless and containerization. So you know what? So a lot of the Java developers are re really looking forward to new uh, Java stack, uh, how to optimize their existing Microsoft application uh, uh, turn into a uh, serverless application. And one of the, the big benefit of the Quarkus, I already mentioned that. So there are Quarkus allows Java developer to build native executable file like a Go, so you don't need to JVM any longer to run Java application because uh, you can package your Java application as executable file. And then just running on that, uh, that file and behind the scene, that executable file uh, running on GrabVM. But many people ask me, okay, GrabVM is uh, developed by Oracle and then 
you know, how to manage some uh, license stuff and uh, some feature, et cetera. Even that is still community. I mean, there are two versions, community, GraVM, also enterprise version. So that's why Red Hat uh, will support maybe around next month. Uh, we will have a Mandrel. It's a new project. Actually, that is a downstream project of GraVM project, but we'll uh, print the more uh, features in GraVM plus OpenJDK open JDK 11 and some debugging features and 100% open source project, just like any other Red Hat projects. And the one of the good thing is uh, that we are using base image of a uh, native scalable file uh, based on the universal uh, base image UBI, minimal yeah. and UBI. And then maybe then, uh, uh, yeah, you maybe uh, talk a little bit more details because uh, some people, okay, so, the Mandrel based on uh, Quarkus image is pretty small and super fast to run them, like a 25 millisecond and just a five or 10 megabyte to run that application. Because previously we need uh, one or two seconds to start up and we need 100 megabyte to run, uh, I mean, memory per frame. But now you may be 30 times less than or uh, 55 times faster than startup how to make it happen. Okay, we, first of all, we are using the UBI image. And what the heck is UBI images? Okay, I can't yeah. explain that, but I'm not an expert in that field. Yeah. So luckily yeah. we have Dan. So why don't you so explain about I'm, that? I'm thing? gonna ask one more question on top of that. Can we have UV, UBI images for ARM as well? Oh, very good question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just you just need different people than us to ask that question. <laughs> um, so that, I think that's covered by uh, uh, product management and stuff like that inside of Red Hat. So U UBI quickly. So I, I like to step back in history. So in in you know when the whole revolution of containers started back in 2013. Um, you know, the, the sort of promise it's it's it, it, the sort of promise of containers was that third parties could basically develop an application put it into a container image and then run it everywhere and it's kind of funny because we've been talking about java which you know 25 years ago was the whole that was the whole concept right if you write it in java you could write it once and run it everywhere um, so in the container world it was it was talking about you you could write the software and run it anywhere and that's that's somewhat true. Uh, the problem is, you know, where do you get support? Um, and and so traditionally, you know, it, uh, you basically have to marry a container image to the Linux kernel, and, and it's the interaction between the two is what you 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 need to get support for, right? It's not just you know the, just the application the image it's really how it interacts with the linux kernel and how it works together and you know traditionally red hat has said that you know we only will support code that we wrote that we you know that came from red hat uh, against the linux kernel and you know so even though you can run say alpine images and you can run ubuntu and you know debian and all this other stuff that all works and it works well and you know we'll red hat will support it uh, you know, as far as, you know, you know, if it's obvious a problem of the kernel, we'll fix it. But we're not going to dig deep into, uh, you know, why you know, your glibc library is not working correctly or because it's not code that we actually ship. It's not stuff that we can even look at the source code, you know, easily to look at the source code of it. Um, and so when you have a problem in an environment where you're using a mixed kernel, you know, kernel, say, from Red Hat and, and software from Ubuntu and something goes wrong, who are you going to call? And, and what's going to invariably is going to happen is you're going to have Canonical saying, you know, that's a Red Hat problem. And you're going to have Red Hat saying that's a Canonical problem. And, you know, you have no solution for that. So Red Hat, when, when the container stuff started happening uh, many years ago, we said the only thing we'll support is RHEL images on top of RHEL uh, uh, containers. And, and so this led, but we, we simultaneously said, at that time that you can't take rel content, right? Our, our licensing for rel content was that you can't take rel software and put it out on any container registry. You would be breaking your agreement with Red Hat and you can't take it and run it on 
other people's uh, container register. You know, can, you know, you can't run it in Docker on top of Ubuntu, right? That's, you know, I mean, you can. It'll work, but it's not, you know, it's not something we support, and it's, it's something we actively discouraged. Um, so that went on for many years during RHEL seven timeframe, and when RHEL eight, a lot of our th third parties were coming to us and saying, you know, would you know, containers. What we end up with containers is we end up with a rel container, and then we end up with a, a non rel container. And the non rel container will run on the non rel platforms. And the rel, so they end up having twice as much stuff, right? And 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 that's not what containers promise, right? The containers promise that we'd have one platform. So what we wanted to do with UBI, uh, university, Universal Base Image, was to take rel content and basically change the licensing around for it. So for these select images, you know, for these select RPMs, you can actually take them and you can store them at a container registry. You can run them on any other platform. Uh, and, and really the goal here is to allow third parties to build their software on top of UBI. And, and if they run it on top of you know, Ubuntu or Debian or Amazon Linux or CentOS, it runs fine and it's fine. You're, you're not breaking any kind of license agreement with Red Hat when you do it. Um, but when you run it on a rel, when you when you link it up with a rel kernel, say in a rel core OS or an OpenShift or something like that, then it's fully supported by Red Hat. So so we basically allowing our third parties now to only have to ship one image, and that image is be built on top of UBI. Now the interest, the the problem with UBI at this point is not all of the software that's shipped inside of rel is available UBI. And that's like a constant, you know, the, don't, don't tell anybody that this is a constant battle inside of Red Hat, you know, because, you know, you know, if we go too far, we're giving away, you know, you know, too much of our software. Um, but, you know, so that's, that's a, an ongoing battle. But we, we, our goal is to give, to, to build all the tools, all the tools that you would want to use in a container environment should be available in UBI. And you can just go, you know, grab a UBI M M8 image and just do a DNF install and it will go out to registries and pull, to, pull down all of the available UBI content. And there's thousands of RPM packages. It's just not, you, you can't, you don't get the Linux kernel. You don't get the rel kernel as UBI, um, but that's really what it is. And so you, instead of saying it's a rel8 kernel, you know, rel8 kernel, um, container image out there with UBI 8, so. Uh. Yeah, that's really awesome. And just, uh, I'm gonna add one more comment uh, and corpus and application perspective. So developer can specify the base image, I mean, based on UBI image on Mandarin image on their corpus application properly file. And then they just uh, kick it off uh, using the Maven plugin command line. It's a normal stuff for developer, like a Maven build, Maven package stuff, and automatically uh, uh, create a build container image and push it to OpenShift container platform automatically with that single command line. And behind the scene, uh, you can also define or use uh, multiple uh, container build strategy, uh, like uh, uh, OpenShift source to I image, uh, source, uh, SQI, so source to image strategy, also Docker build okay. or yeah, so using the zip, the Google container build tool as well. So there are multiple way, uh, I think multiple tools for developer uh, to build container image based on UBI and also uh, some generate the Kubernetes manifesto, like a resource definition or OpenShift definition, like a service deployment, et cetera, all YAML file stuff. It's all generated automatically and uh, the use that generate YAML file and deploy OpenShift container platform. Just once again, the developer standpoint, they just run the single Maven command line and the everything will be uh, done automatically for developer. So the right. old technology stack, it compose and they uh, make it happen for developer. This is one, one of the cool stuff for Red Hat, some technology on Kubernetes and uh, UBI and Quarkus. Right. This is, this is pretty cool. This is, this is going really deep into yep. the container strategy. I, I want to lift one more question a little bit out of the details. And, and let's say, let's, let's, let's say I am building an application and I have five, six different containers and maybe, you know, in the future I have another 10, uh, scheduled. How do you visualize 
these de dependencies and how do you maintain that knowledge right because it seems like as soon as the developer is done with one container they move on to the next container and very quickly you start to lose like what depended on what and so how do you do we have tooling for that to to visualize these architectural dependencies with between containers and yeah how do you maintain that knowledge is that something you guys uh, about? Yeah, maybe I can take the question, but not D3. Yeah, so just in my case. So maybe uh, just just a couple of things just uh, come to my mind. So first of all, uh, OpenShift Container Platform uh, provide the Dev Console. It's a pretty cool stuff. And you deploy your multiple container image as part on top of the OpenShift Container Platform. And Dev Console provide the topology view. And you can see multiple part just like eyeball candies and then you can um, uh, make some relationship between a multiple version or okay this part is spring boot and this part is post square and then you can uh, draw some line between that eyeball candies part okay so now two part have a relationship and then you keep deploying multiple version like a revision stuff and then you can find okay this part have a stuff three revision, even some less or is traditional a step for Microsoft's application. So this is one of the way, and just a little bit more the just container layer stuff, maybe query or uh, have to provide some UI. Maybe Dan uh, give right. some more detail. About yeah, I mean, that. yeah, we said, so the goal with, with containerization is all about, you know, basically, you know, the, uh, building building blocks, right? Sort of Legos. Um, so you want to get you know, each one of your container image to be a micro, you know, microservice. And all microservice means is that that container does one thing. It's a web service or it's a database or it's a, a load balancer. And um, so once you have sort of those building blocks of an application, now you want to go into Kubernetes and orchestrate them together. And that's, uh, you know, that's what Daniel was talking about is, you know, connecting together and, and the other thing you want to be able to do is say how many instances, uh, you know, what kind of um, capabilities do you want to have in your application, right? So if you're, uh, you're at, at certain levels of load, you want to, you know, kick kick me off another web, you know, kick me off another web server because you know um, suddenly my, my you know my performance is starting to fall, or, or give me another database to uh, help load balance the environment, and and really that becomes you know at that point. It almost leaves the developer's area and moves into sort of the administrator's world at that point because he's building, you know, he's sort of maintaining this this greater application. So um, the interesting thing, you know, it's a DevOps. You know, the whole idea of DevOps is the developers, in my opinion, are mainly developing um, low-level building blocks, and then sort of a higher, maybe an architect level is, is to figure out how to orchestrate, you know, to hook them up together, and then you move it into operation stage where you know, he has all the building blocks, he has them all wired together, but now he has to figure out how to manage, uh, you manage costs so that, you know, you don't want to have a thousand VMs, a thousand containers sitting out there doing nothing um, on multiple VMs, which are just costing you money, but be able to scale up and scale down as as your your environments change over the, the, the course of the period. So, um, but again, the, the problem is we're we're low level guys, so uh, you know I, I I live I, I live a much lower level. I, mean, I you know if you want to you know where I'm interested in you know my my focus in, in our group is usually at the lowest level. So I, I'm always looking for new ideas on how how can I get images to be pulled quicker. You know how can I you know, the, you know I look at uh, you know, how can I get memory, the memory footprint print down? You know, uh, you know, a lot of these tools are, are way too big. And we were talking about CRC earlier and CRC is a, uh, you know, to run Kubernetes, uh, to run OpenShift inside of a, a VM right now, it takes eight gigabytes. And that's, that's you know, and, and, and what's happening in a, a OpenShift cluster is, is they have all of these tools running constantly. They're called operators, but basically these operators, uh, their main goal is to make sure the environment stays up and runs properly. And they do things like managing upgrades to the operating system and manage the whole flow. So an interesting thing when we talked earlier was um, when I, you know, 
if I want to run Kubernetes on my laptop, what is Kubernetes, right? <laughs> and, and and so the intro you you were talking about uh, you know uh, this kind, which is uh, you know Kubernetes inside of a container. The D stood for something I don't talk about anymore. Uh, but the uh, uh, you know that's sort of a low level way of doing it. Um, and then you get to real, you know, what we consider OpenShift Kubernetes, which is all these operators and stuff running constantly inside of an image. And that's one of the reasons that it becomes difficult to run a full Kubernetes, a real Kubernetes environment on a single laptop because Kubernetes was designed to work in the cloud, right? To work on virtual machines, to work in on physical hardware. Um, and it's really a, a sort of an enterprise level suite of applications and trying to take that and and somehow squeeze it onto a laptop is always going to be uh, you know uh, fairly difficult uh, one of the things i would like to talk about uh, is you know and i'll ask you know to me these things are interesting that what 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 excites us you know what are the things that we're looking forward to over the next six months to uh, to come along that are going to you know potentially um, change people's view, you know, like you know, what's the next Quarkus or, or what is the next, you know, Podman and things like that. Um, and, and that, you know, for me, getting excited is looking at, you know, some of the developments that are going on in the Linux kernel. Um, so we're Red Hat's right now invested quite a bit in, um, in using virtual machine technology for, for running containers. So we're working with, uh, um, Kata, which is, was originally developed by Intel and, um, uh, um, so instead of having traditional containers, looking at how can we manage really lightweight VMs running a container workload. So it's, it's really running containers in, in sort of a very light um, virtual machine. Um, but there's another project where there's some really smart engineers at Red Hat that have been working on this thing called Live K Run, which is really exciting me, which is um, unlike the uh, Cotter uses QEMU for running a, you know, basically the same way we run VMs. And what these en these virtualization engineers have done is they've actually got a kernel as PID1 sort of inside of a container and it uses KVM inside of it. But all the processes inside of the container are all seen at the system. So it just looks like normal prod, looks like a normal container running on the system, except that instead of talking to the host kernel, it's actually talking to a a kernel that's inside of his namespaces and stuff. I have no idea how it works, but it's really, really cool. And you know, my interest there is is you know, is this the future? Am I am I looking at the the, the next sort of next wave of how we're going to do you know, this container technologies? And again, because it it looks like they can do it much smaller. And you know, so you know, I think the end goal with all of Kubernetes is to get to the point where we can run thousands of these containers on, you know, a limited number of hosts and really maximize the, the amount of, uh, you know, CPU, you know, of, of individual boxes. Um, so th those are, you know, as I said, so I'll let Daniel tell me what in the next six months, what's the most exciting thing you see coming? Yeah, sure. And then uh, the sound really oh, exciting to me, actually. So yeah, Quarker stuff. So as I already mentioned earlier, so we're going to support the hundred percent, uh, native comparison based on Mandura project. And also we're gonna put together uh, more serverless and fast function as a service features uh, in, uh, tied, uh, integrated with the OpenShift serverless feature. So for example, developer standpoint, they will have a single command line like based on a Kubernetes native, Kubernetes K native command line like a KN and just KN create a fast and then you can just create a new function based on Quarkus application. And uh, at a time that will be deployed up with the container platform as a K-neighbor service. And also uh, we're gonna de integrate uh, with the OpenShift pipeline. And then uh, inside the pipeline, uh, the your Quarkus application, actually Java application will be uh, compiled package uh, as native comparison and based on uh, UBI imagery and deploy uh, multiple uh, platform. And also in community side, uh, Quarkers already provide uh, the serverless uh, Java portable API, also known the name, also known as uh, Funky. I love, I actually I love the name Funky. It's a standard standard uh, Java portable API, so you can deploy 
So same corpus application into multiple fast and serverless platforms such as Amazon Lambda and Open Container Platform and uh, Kubernetes Knative and also Google Function, Azure Function. But point is you have still same application. You don't need to change anything in the application side, but you just needed to add uh, some server information. Okay, this is a deploy Azure function. This is a deploy to Amazon Lambda. This is a deploy to Kubernetes and OpenShift. Only configuration minor thing, and but the other, the application side exactly same. So maybe maybe I could say, oh, this is a hybrid serverless deployment with the same application developer perspective. But behind the scenes, as Dan already mentioned, there are a lot of multiple and complex technology uh, exists there. So we are working on that in the application side and the infrastructure layer and the workers as well as uh, the new Jakar EE or uh, also known as Java EE, so nine, it's a new feature. So there are a lot of tools and features uh, really, really about uh, Kubernetes and uh, cloud native and microservice evangelical stuff and uh, will be coming soon. Very cool, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think we've reached the the, uh, the end of the time, so I think we can continue for another hour. But I think we have to wrap up here. Yeah, I think so, this is a good stopping stopping yeah. stopping. Yeah, yeah. There, there was one question about a coloring book, so I just want to. <laughs> uh, I sure. do want to answer that. So uh, obviously, we didn't have a Red Hat Summit this year, and that would have been the time that we were going to do a coloring book. Uh, so if you saw my session um, earlier, the uh, yesterday, where I talked about container security, uh, I basically write a, the, the stories around you know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and and talking about uh, you know how we can get to more secure environments uh, to move from Goldilocks to Papa Bear, and um, so that would have been the coloring book. And I'm hoping if if the world you know gets back to normal at some point, we will have a coloring book that that. That covers the story of Lowly Glocks on Three Bears. And I have a, uh, just, <laughs> I, I haven't shown it to anybody yet, but this, um, uh, one of the key things in, in pods is this concept of sidecar containers. And um, so a sidecar container is basically, you know, when you have a pod, you have sort of the primary container, and then people put other containers in it to sort of monitor it. I think, uh, um, Istio is, is taking heavy advantage of, of, of this type of environment. Uh, but usually when I give talks, I tell people, you know, uh, uh, to watch out for sidecar containers because I think that they're, they're just a way for the next wave of everybody, you know, adding third party products that just keep on putting sidecar containers into primary containers. And, and you'll get to the point where you launch, you know, instead of launching one application, you'll launch one container application will come with five sidecars. And so every time you launch one of those, you're running you know, all these other containers that are just watching what the primary container is. And so we have a, a new part of the coloring book is actually showing what happens when you have a motorcycle and you start to add sidecar containers to it. And you know, with the three you know, with the three bears and Goldilocks. And it's a very funny video, but it, it makes sense yeah. you know, to, to try to convince people to not take advantage of sidecar containers. And, um, so, anyways, it's uh, there yeah, are some that, interesting guys. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely. Yeah, that's definitely. I, I uh, for time. my son and daughter, I really <laughs> yes. support yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you want you want your kids to understand <laughs> computer security. Yeah. Vehicle, vehicle I try. I, I will do my best to explain <laughs> that thing. <laughs> yeah. so. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, if I want one of those coloring books, do I have to just uh, uh yeah, you well, on the, Twitter? the coloring books are <laughs> always available for printing in your own uh house, so there's, there's three of them out there right now, and, and this will be the fourth. Um, but yeah, they, they'll, they'll always be open source, so there'll be you know, Creative Commons license. Uh, Maureen, uh, Maureen okay. Duffy, I just come up with the ideas, and Maureen Duffy makes them look beautiful, so uh. Yeah, really, ninety percent of it goes to her. I just have wacky ideas, and she she makes them look, she makes them into something. So, so it's a fun thing to do. Yeah. All right. Thanks, thanks, guys. I think we have to all move over to the uh, to the two of them yep. in the track at this point. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Kurt and Dan. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.